What do you know about it, Chigilski? What do any of us know about anything? In the last video, we started a discussion about the VGA subsystem and the graphics capability of the Raspberry Pi board that I'm using as an external AV slash console chip in my 6502 based retro computer. As a reminder, the way it's implemented is via the bitmap graphics mode, which means that each pixel on the screen is directly addressable by a specific byte in video RAM. Now due to the resolution of the screen, 640 by 480, and the color depth for each pixel, which is four bits, this means that we need to set aside about 154 kilobytes of RAM as our frame buffer. Since the Raspberry Pi Pico, well, actually the RP2040 chip, which serves as the core of the Raspberry Pi Pico, since that only has 264 kilobytes of RAM available, and that is not extendable, means that we are limited to a single frame buffer in our implementation. This adds some unique challenges to our design and architecture. For example, to ensure smooth animation, the standard solution is to have at least two frame buffers. One which serves as the active frame buffer and contains the images and the graphics that are currently being displayed on the monitor. And a second frame buffer, which is the working frame buffer. And this is the area where the next frame of animation is being updated and written to. What you want to do, obviously, is to avoid updating an image while the screen is displaying that particular image. The idea with using a dual frame buffer is that once the next frame in the working frame buffer is completely created and drawn as required, you then switch the frame buffers. So the working frame buffer now becomes the active frame buffer, and the previously active one now can become the new working frame buffer. This means that you are never updating the live frame buffer. Now, because we only have a single frame buffer, we don't have that luxury. So for us, we need to update the image as quickly and as efficiently as possible. This means that when moving large images such as sprites, we can't do so pixel by pixel. Instead, we have to operate directly on large areas of memory, at least eight bytes worth at a time. So let's look at the actual implementation of a sprite, or a tile for that matter, since fundamentally the two are very similar. The main distinction between a sprite and a tile is that a sprite uh, is expected to move, whereas a tile does not. We support two sizes of sprites, a 16 pixel width as well as a 32 pixel width. The height is user defined and there are really no restrictions on the height of a sprite other than the available memory. The reason why we chose 16 and 32 pixel widths is because, again, remembering that there are two pixels per byte, a 16 pixel width corresponds to an eight byte word. And these are very easily manipulated inside of the C software development kit. Here is a very simple sprite that's used in the demo program. On the upper left, you'll see the palette that refers to our 16 colors that we support, as well as the color we have chosen to represent the transparency color or the transparency pixel. So for example, these pixels right here, the darker gray and the lighter gray, 
actually represent the colors that we want displayed from the pixel. Whereas these pixels back here correspond to transparency, which tells the software that these are not actual colors to be displayed, but instead we want the background to show through this area. In essence, when you create a sprite, you're doing two things. You're actually describing the characteristics of the sprite itself, but you are also inferring the bitmap mask associated with the sprite. So how do we go from this little image to data that can be stored and used by the RP2040 graphics subsystem? Well, first let's recall that for each color in this palette, there is a specific RGB value that they correspond to. And these RGB values are in the RGB 332 format. Once we're done, we can then export this image as a BMP file, otherwise called a bitmap file, even though it's not the bitmap version that we will actually be using. So the program I use to actually draw the sprites actually allows us to also export it as a Windows bitmap file format. So by exporting it, we're able to choose the layers and the frames. This is just a single frame in this case. To a specific file, we're exporting it. And then once that's done, we need to operate on that bitmap file and convert that information to actual C byte data. That conversion is actually done by a different program, and I'll provide a pointer to it in the video description. The program, which is written in Node.js, takes the newly created bitmap file as input and then creates a C file that contains the actual information of what that bitmap would look like as a C array. So let's actually take a look at that. Here, you can see, and this is the one that we'll be looking at, we're, we're using the RGB332 format right here, and that's the, the first one that looked at. And you can see that what it's gone ahead and done is that looked at each of the pixels in that image and has assigned it a byte level data. FB corresponds to a transparency value, FF corresponds to a white value, and other values correspond to other colors in there as well. Here we can see in the demo program how we've gone ahead and just cut and paste that uh, C array into the demo program right here. We've called it Foo2, and Foo2 corresponds to that spaceship sprite. And then later on, what we do is we load that array into our sprite table using the load sprite routine. So let's actually take a look and see what load sprite does. This is the load sprite routine. And after some base housekeeping uh, information to make sure that things are correct, such as we're not using more sprites than we're allowed, or we're not replacing an existing sprite, we need to figure out whether the data that we're reading it in is one which already exists, or whether we're going to be reading it in via the VGA system itself. If it's not already created data and we're actually going to be reading it in, then we need to set aside that memory and then read it in byte by byte to create this larger array. Now that we actually have the array data that corresponds to the description of the sprite, we can now create 
the actual bitmap version that we want to store, as well as auto create the mask associated with it. Again, the mask simply determines which pixels should be transparent and which ones should be opaque. The opaque ones being the actual pixels that correspond to the sprite that we want to draw. Now, as noted before, the data that we're reading in is actually in RGB332 format, and we actually want to convert that information to our own internal representation of these colors. We take care to check for a transparency level color and mask out the information as required. This way, we're actually creating the bitmap that corresponds to the sprite, as well as the mask that's associated with it as well. Now that we have the sprite stored in our internal sprite array, how do we actually display it on the screen? That's the function of the draw sprite routine. The actual core is this part right here. Now, because we only have a single frame buffer, the first thing we want to do is store the actual background information that we will be overwriting because the simple and easy way to erase a sprite is just to restore the original background. And so knowing where the sprite is going to be, we store the eight bytes that correspond to that background. We then use the mask that we've generated and end that with the background, creating a mask of what actually will be seen through, how much of the background will be seen and how much of it will be blocked by the sprite. We then overlay the actual sprite itself on top of that and then copy that information to the frame buffer video data array. And we do that for each row of the sprite. We then store away the X and Y coordinate of the starting point of that sprite. And we tell the software that the background information that we've just stored away is actually valid. So at that point in time, when we need to erase the sprite from the background, we simply take that X and Y coordinate that was stored away, pull out the background data that we stored, and copy it back to the previous location in the frame buffer. Now, of course, the entire draw sprite routine is not as easy or as straightforward as I may have led you to believe. There is a lot of detail that needs to go in here, especially considering for the fact that sprites can only be part way on the screen. And so we need to worry about what happens when a sprite is, is halfway on the left hand side or the right hand side of the monitor. In those cases, we need to shift pixels either left or right so only part of the sprite shows up. But the problem with that is because pixels correspond to either the upper four bits of a byte or the lower four bits of a byte, it's not as easy as just shifting a byte, but you actually have to shift nibbles of a byte. And after a while, all of that can get somewhat tedious. The advantage, of course, is that this is completely transparent to the user. All they need to worry about is specifying the X and Y coordinate of the sprite and then calling the draw sprite routine, as we can see in the core demo program itself, where after we create the 32 sprites that we'll be displaying, in a loop, we simply update the X and Y coordinates. We're even telling the draw sprite routine to auto erase the previous location of the sprite. You'll notice, however, 
that this is all being done and is running on the RP2040, where the intent is to actually have this running on the 6502, or at least having the 6502 programs call these routines directly. So how do we do that? And of course, that's not really just a question for how do you draw sprites, but also how do you draw graphics primitives? How do you draw text? How do you tell the VGA system the X and Y coordinate of a text character you want to write? Well, this interface between the 6502 and the VGA subsystem utilizes what's called ANSI escape sequences. And that will be the topic of the next video. I hope to see you there. Thanks a bunch.